the BFA Interior Design Department and Student Health and Counseling Services at the School of Visual Arts, which is very well represented at the front row here, <laughs> um, present Home and uh, the Poetics of Space. It's a presentation uh, by Esther Sperber and uh, Nava Steiner. Um, Esther Sperber uh, founded Studio ST Architects in 2003 after working at um, Pi Partnerships Architects for five years, um, during which time she had the privilege of working closely with MI, uh, Mr. I. M. Pi, um, Pay, excuse me. Uh, she's born and raised in Jerusalem, Israel. She completed her undergraduate work at uh, Technion and came to New York in 1997. Uh, to complete a master's degree at architecture at Columbia University. Um, Esther writes and lectures on architecture and psychoanalysis. Just a little bit about Studio ST Architects. It's a full service, woman owned architectural firm located in Manhattan. Uh, it is dedicated to exploring the embedded logic of materials and structures to generate new spatial experiences. The firm believes in innovative and responsible design and is committed to sustainable buildings. Um, so at this time, I'd like to first welcome Esther Sperber, followed by Nava Steiner. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Nava, to, for inviting me, and I'm really happy to be here. I have to say I've spoken to architects and um, interior designers, and I've spoken to psychologists, but I've never spoken to kind of a mixed crowd. So I'm excited to try this experiment. Um, home. What a wonderful and provocative word and idea for an architect who loves psychoanalysis. A word that evokes layers of feelings, memories, hopes, along with need, loss and mortality. I'd like to explore the notion of a home from three perspectives. I invite you to join me as we enter through a few memories of my own childhood. I will then turn to some theoretical structures that frame my understanding of the architectural experience and I will end with constructive thoughts on how we design homes for clients. Have you noticed how heavily our language relies on architectural metaphors? We enter a discussion, we structure a deal. There are foundations and overarching ideas, thresholds, cornerstones. We envelop, we shelter, we contain. Here's a little assignment. Try to think while we're speaking of other words like that that come from architecture that we use in just to talk about thinking and feeling. Let's enter through the front doorway that Gaston Bachelard, the French philosopher and phenomenologist, invites us to use in his book, The Poetics of Space, which inspired the title of this presentation. He writes, if I were to name the chief benefit of the house, I should say the house shelters dreaming. The house protects the dreamer. The house allows one to dream in peace. Thought and experience are not the only things that sanction human value. The value that belongs to daydreaming marks humanity in its depth. It derives direct pleasure from its own being. And he continues, now my aim is clear. I must show that the house is one of the greatest powers of integration of thought and memory and dreams, thoughts and memories and dreams of mind, mankind. The binding principle in this integration is the daydream. Bachelard's work aspires to expand the range of what we see as human thought and to position daydreaming and imagination at the center, alongside, or perhaps even in place of rational thinking. For Bachelard, the home is the sanctuary in which daydreaming and these kind of thoughts can take place. The word home, of course, is not identical to the word, to the word house. Home is both a place and a mental idea. It is a colored, dense, heavy metaphor from its very beginning. 
When I say home, I first think of my own childhood home. I grew up in Jerusalem in an apartment on the second floor of a small building. I lived in this home with my parents, my sisters and brothers, our dog, an outside cat. Later, my grandmother moved in with us. And despite the tight quarters, my mother wanted each child to have their own space and built lofts and nooks for each of us. We never really had a living room. The center of activity was a large sun-filled kitchen. A platter of dried fruit and nuts were always waiting for a stream of friends and visitors that passed through. And while the kitchen was the social heart of our home, my father's library was its intellectual, almost sacred counterpart, housing almost over 10,000 books, including some ancient manuscripts. And though we knew not to interrupt my father's studies, we were always welcome to come in to discuss our homework or social situations. But my home extended beyond our own apartment. My home included the eclectic group of neighbors that lived in the building, a collage of Israeli society in the 70s. On the ground floor, with exclusive use of the garden, lived Rosa. She was a short, elderly woman who immigrated from Istanbul with a bright gold tooth and a husband who owned a cluttered shoe shop downtown. Her husband's children from a previous marriage constantly fought with her, and she in turn yelled at us to be quiet. Next to Rosa, in this door, lived a family that had recently immigrated to Israel from Uzbekistan. The father, a Russian-speaking dentist, more gold teeth, and his wife, who worked as his assistant, opened their dental practice in the front room of their apartment. My parents installed a swing set and a sandbox on the roof, and we spent many hours playing there. A studio apartment bisected the, the building's roof and was shared by two female roommates and their golden shepherd dog. Back then, I didn't know the word lesbians, but I now wonder if they were a couple. Directly from the street, one could enter the Makolet. Now it's a pet shop. A bodega-style grocery store from which we got milk and fresh bread every morning. Berger and Genzel were the owners, and they lived down the street on a one-way street in which Netanyahu's parents lived as well. We whispered about the numbers tattooed on their arm. People said they became friends in a concentration camp. Looming large was Mrs. Levy, whom we irrationally feared. And this was her entrance. She was a small, hunched over old lady and lived in the basement, entered from the side alley where the garbage cans were placed. Her thick glasses, one lens covered with a white sticker to hide a missing eye, obscured her gaze as she yelled at us to be quiet between two and four, the official siesta of those times. But when we think about homes, our homes are not only the ones in which we were born, the places our parents created intentionally or by circumstances. Home was also my college dorm, the first steps of independent life, the first flirtations, and then a series of illegal rent control sublets in which I lived when I came to New York. And finally, home is a place that I was fortunate to design for my own family. In renovating apartments, I often tell my clients, we have the opportunity, a bit like when we design a wedding dress, to create something that is custom made, particularly for us. Home as primal architecture. The word home, perhaps like the word mother, evokes layers of meaning that exceeds its physical or biological space. Think of the word mother. She's the womb and the breast, nature and nurture, protection and punishment. She's gendered and desired and sometimes overwhelming. Mother is what I call my mother and the word that my daughters use for me. Mother is what the psychoanalyst Winnicott called the total supportive environment. The word home has a similar density of meaning because, it is, because of its central role as the place of intimacy, safety, and dwelling. 
But in fact, all architecture is a loaded experience. Here's another architectural idiom. It is always both a physical reality and a sign or symbol for that reality. Its, its function is to shelter us, and it, is that, and it has that symbolic meaning. As the most primal architecture, the home is the place in our mind and a building of walls, windows, and roofs. Later in his book, Bachelard contemplates the bird's nest as a primordial home. He notices that a loose pile of twigs is a symbol for care and security, despite its physical precarious fragility. Home is where our human needs are acted out. At home, we cook and eat and shit and bathe and talk and have sex and sleep and read bedtime stories. It is a place of celebration and mourning dreams, nightmares, and insomnia. At home, we can be free or trapped, and because it is rooted so deep in our hearts, it's where misunderstanding and misrecognition are most painful. Architecture, I think, is unusual among the arts in that it does not represent an object or a feeling outside of itself. Its meanings reside within its actual structures. The building's roof, and walls physically protect us and emotionally give us shelter. Its columns support it from the pull of gravity, and metaphorically, they support our activities in it. And its concrete foundation, which is securely buried in the earth, also symbolically creates the footing on which our institutions can be built. Architecture is a complex, ongoing interplay between these primordial, sensual experiences and their cultural, symbolic counterparts. You might be thinking, especially the therapist, that this is exactly what the psychoanalyst Winnicott meant when he gave us the term transitional object, an object which, about which one should never ask if it is real or unreal. And a great example of that are teddy bears or the blanket that a little child carries around with. But I think there's an important distinction between a building and a teddy bear. While Winnicott's transitional object has a power that comes from an, our emotional attachment to it, perhaps as a replacement for our mother who went to work, we respond to buildings because of, their actual phys because of the actual physical experience that they impose on us. They affect us because our embodied reaction to the physicality of light, sound, orientation, and stability. Winnicott's transitional object operates in an in internal interpsychic realm in our minds. But a building is always also a concrete relationship between us and its event. It links the mind of the designer, the urban space, the culture, and the experience of the visitor. The architectural theorist Jane Randall makes a compelling case to see architecture not as a dialogue but as a trialogue, a three-way communication, communication event that links the architect, the building, and the visitor. This, in her view, creates a situated architectural experience. The architectural historian Alberto Perez Gomez, in his book Built Upon Love, suggests that love is at the core of the architectural praxis. Because architecture is both a physical and a mental experience, he writes, architectural meaning is neither intellectual nor aesthetic, but originates instead in our, embodied, in our embodiment and its erotic impulses. The effects of architecture transcend the purely visual or theoretical by evoking both memory, expectation, ex memory and expectation of erotic fulfillment in the thick of vivid presence. So architecture, at its best, communicates directly with both our mind and our body, stimulated, stimulating unconscious processes which are felt even if not understood. Through architecture, we connect to memories, longings, and our own body, a process that can also be enabled by therapy. But architecture does not only express the link of the physical and the symbolic. It is also a study of 
relationships between individuals and society, between private interiors and the public city. As architects and designers, our task is to create spaces for various functions, and we achieve this by designing the walls and facades that make these activities possible. By designing exteriors, we create interiors. Or maybe architecture is a meditation on entering and exiting. It articulates the frames that contain our life. And since all buildings link inside and outside, architecture is also a study of self and other relationships. And psychoanalysis might be viewed as a similar investigation. In therapy, the therapist and patient explore the space between people, how I react to you, how you project onto me, memories, dreams, enactment, and affect all occupy or create the liminal zone between the individual and the role and the world, between ego and reality. So no doubt architecture and psychoanalysis are quite different in many ways, but both share a curiosity about this interpersonal space. And both are interested in how we relate ourselves to others and ourselves to a bigger field. And I would now like to um, turn to the third part of my talk, which is about the process of design and what I call relational creativity. I now arrive at the third constructive section of this talk, and then I'll show a bunch of slides. Um, and would like to explore the psychoanal psychoanalytic ideas that have helped me conceptualize the design process. Although the topic of this lecture is home, I work in a very similar way with both my residential and commercial and institutional clients. And I will, short and I will shortly show some slides of both types of projects. The architectural client, perhaps like the therapy patient, turned to the architect with the problem, a lack of space or a frustration with the space that limits their growth. But like many patients, my clients often cannot describe what it is that they want. If all I give them is what they request, they would be deeply disappointed. It is through a process of joint investigation, what I like to call relational creativity, that we first uncover their wishes and then try to discover a design solution. The architectural project, the building, is probably one of the most complex problems that finds a singular physical solution in the form of a concrete structure. As architect Stan Allen writes, the praxis of architecture tends to be messy and idiosyncratic and inconsistent precisely because it has to negotiate a reality that is itself messy and inconsistent. From psychology we learn that we can often better understand our own self when we are talking to another person. But architecture has a long history of seeing the architect as an autonomous, most likely male, genius who works alone, using his imaginative powers to overcome reality and prevail over his clients. This image of the architect as a sole author of the building still prevails and overshadows the fundamental interpersonal aspect of creative processes. A prime example of this fallacy can be seen in the Pritzker Prize Committee's continuous refusal to recognize Denise Scott Brown, that's her, um, alongside her husband and work partner Robert Venturi for their joint work for which he alone received the prize in 1992. Scott Brown, who recently celebrated her 84th birthday, has repeatedly exposed this distortion, calling us to finally, these are in her words, salute the no notion of joint creativity. As I understand design, it is precisely the ability to collaborate, negotiate, and incorporate input from many sources which leads to successful designs. The designer is challenged to stand in the spaces between her own dreams and the demands of reality, allowing the building to emerge from these negotiations, not as a preconceived independent idea, but as a form that embeds within it mem the memories and logics of the design and construction process and the traces and scars of its own birth. To close, I would like to share a few architectural projects to demonstrate how the design process
takes place in a co-created field of joint creativity. I cannot speak for the entire profession, but for me, the most exciting, unexpected, and creative moments are those of this type of relational creativity, when after a frustrating stuckness, an idea emerges, an idea which is not authored by any one individual, moments in which the boundaries between people are blurred, and innovation surfaces from within the field of interaction. So I'd like to look first at four projects and talk a little bit about the design process, and then I'll just go through a whole bunch of spaces that fall under the title of home. Um, and I chose four projects um, to demonstrate four different types of interactions with a wider field. Um, off the wall, in which I want to talk a little bit about materials, the Kesher Synagogue, in which I would like to talk about interacting with the site, um, 14th Street Y Community Center, which was really a, a project of teamwork, and 535 West End um, humongous apartment in which I'm going to talk a little about the collaborative process with a client. Um, Off the Wall Exhibition was an in invitation to design a show that was going to be for two weeks in the Jewish Museum of town. And um, 11 different artists were going to come work in the museum galleries for two weeks. And we were designing the workspace and exhibit space for those artists. Um, we had these three rooms. Um, this we called the pixelated mattress. This one was a pedestal mountains, and this was um, the canyon, canyon wall. Um, the pixelated mattress room was a series of cubes made out of foam um, for two DJs. Um, they were going to exhibit their music and create new music out of the museum's collection of um, old Jewish music. And in trying to think of how to exhibit music, we thought we should create this funky space to sit on and tether to it a bunch of iPods. Um, and it was really fun. Kids were jumping all over the place. Um, this is the cardboard wall. Um, you can see this was a space for people to sit and look at a video art installation. And this was the desk for the artist. Um, we picked these materials. Sorry, I have to backtrack. The, the foam, the cardboard, and you'll see this other kind of foam, ester foam, um, because they're all used by the museum. We found them in the um, basement as art packaging material. And the idea was just as we were exposing the work of the artist in the museum gallery, we were going to use, expose the back of house of the museum and use materials that they use for um, delivering and packaging art. So the cardboard, um, while well, layers of cardboard, and we cut them and stack them. Um, you can see people looking at the display on the other wall and the desk for the artist, and then some screens for other work. And this space was shared by um, a fashion designer and these multimedia artists. And each of these mountains had one of the fashion designer runway shows. Um, so they had uh, screens showing the show and two pieces from that. Um, and he was working in there as well. Um, the second project was a synagogue competition that we won and we worked on for about a year and a half until the economy crashed and then um, it actually just opened but was finished by a different architect. Um, the interesting, one of the interesting problems about this project was that the clients had a fairly small site with this um, very large blue building on it, um, which they wanted to potentially keep. They weren't sure if they would keep it or not. And so we were challenged to design a building that could wrap around this building. And these are just a few of the many, many 3D sketches that we did um, trying to come up with a form for this building around the, the blue Victorian house. And this is the plan that um, actually was constructed. So it's um, there's a typology of a suburban split level house where you enter in the middle, you can go up half a floor, usually to the bedrooms, and go down half a floor to the living room, dining room, or the other way around. And that's basically the, um, the organization of this building. So you come in, there's a lobby, um, 
daily sanctuary offices and coat room. You could either take a ramp up to the main sanctuary or you could take another big ramp down to the social hall. Um, and on the lower level, once you got down to the social hall, underneath the sanctuary you would connect to all the classrooms for youth programming and the mechanical spaces. Um, so this is the entrance, the daily chapel. You'd enter through this area. The main sanctuary is back here and the social hall is on the other side. And as you can see, all these different spaces that wrap around the building are actually linked to the exterior. So it kind of creates a continuous loop in which you can enter and exit on every level. You'll see it a little bit also from the back. This is if the blue building is gone, then they get a whole front yard. Um, from above, you can see the three main um, functions. This is the daily chapel. There's a green roof where you could, uh, you could come out from the main sanctuary, then main sanctuary hovering above, and the social hall. And from this sanctuary, you'll see there's a big um, terrace balcony that wraps down and connects you back to this lower level. This is the sanctuary um, above the classrooms and this ramp that comes down to the front. And image of the sanctuary space. Um, I guess what I would like to highlight is that, you know, sometimes you think this is a site with so many problems, there's nothing you can do with it. There's actually no room for a building here. But one of the beautiful things that came out of this design was really grappling with the site and a, what I see as a kind of collaboration between our design um, wishes and the constraints of that space and the existing building, um, which allowed a kind of much more interesting building to emerge and something that had we had a just big open flat stop space, we probably would never come up with. Um, the fourth one I wanted to talk about was a, the question of collaborating with the team and a team including our own team and us and the client. Um, we were invited to do a, what was initially supposed to be a very small renovation of the fitness center at um, the 14th Street Y, which is on 14th and 1st. Um, it's a community center that um, serves a really diverse population. They have Japanese parenting and swimming for 80 year olds plus um, and after school for anyone in the neighborhood. And in trying to think about how to help them with the fitness center, it became apparent that the problem was not really so much an upgrade to the fitness center, it was that they didn't have a communal space. They didn't have a lobby in which all these different people could um, hang out and interact. And another problem that seemed um, to be um, insolvable was that there was no real circulation space. You had to go from one program through the next program to get. So in order to get to the pool, which was in this diagram right here, from from the front street, from 14th Street, you had to go through the lobby and then through the service area and then through the fitness center and then through the locker rooms and you'd finally get to the pool. And there was no hallway. Um, we decided to actually use that as an opportunity to highlight the, this multi-purpose type of space in which all these different activities happen in once and celebrate the fact that you have to walk from one space to another and see all these different things happening at once. I'm just so. Um, what we proposed was taking, they had a, this is 14th Street, um, they had a whole bunch of offices right up here in the front, on the front facade, and a tiny little entry vestibule in the hallway, and people used to come into the fitness center here. And we said, you know, let's try to make a real lobby. Let's take out all these offices, find a new space for them, um, and move the entrance to the fitness center so that you go straight from here into the fitness center, locker rooms, um, showers, pool, um, this part we didn't renovate. Um, and in doing that, we, we realized that we were creating these strips of functions, and um, we wanted to highlight that. And so we organized both the lobby. Um, so this is the lounge seating. This is the cafe seating. This is circulation. And then the fitness center. These are the elliptical machines. This is These are the weight machines. This is the cardio, um, according to these bands that you have to walk through. Um, so this is the lobby before the renovation. These are the offices off the facade, the security desk, and the little hallway. 
Um, and this is the new lobby after we took out all those offices and opened the space up to um, 14th Street. Another interesting thing was there was a tiny, tiny, tiny budget. Um, so we mostly removed things. So we moved the drop ceiling. We removed the vinyl floor. Um, there were a few places where we added like this beautiful blue um, cement tiles. But as you can see, we couldn't deal with any of these pipes. We just painted them grayish blue and put in new fluorescents. Um, this is the old fitness center. It had a black painted ceiling and a very disgusting carpet. <laughs> and this is the new fitness center. Same ceiling, uh, new lighting, um, new rubber floor. Again, we had a, with the limited budget, we could, they were going to put a rubber floor in, so we just played with the colors because that doesn't ask, add cost. And these colors kind of help you find your way to the program piece that you want. So it also helps people feel more comfortable in the space because they kind of get a sense that they know where they're going and what they're looking for. These are the old locker rooms and the new locker rooms. Um, we used construction lights for the ceiling and we removed the vinyl tile and just kept the exposed concrete floor. Um, we poured this really nice epoxy on it just to um, keep it clean with um, mixed with sand which makes it non-slip. Um, and for the lockers, again, we used the most generic kind of New York sports club um, lockers. And the manufacturer thought we were crazy because we um, selected five different um, laminates. And every laminate company only makes one yellow or one orange. So they came from four different companies. Um, and then when the guy installed it, he was like, oh, I get it. That's what you wanted. Um, the last um, collaborative project I want to show is a, a work we did for a client. Um, they bought a full floor of an apartment building on, uh, on the Upper West Side. It's uh, insane, um, but beautiful. And um, it, was a real, it was really interesting to try to figure out with the, this couple what they want their home to look like. They came with initially very, very different ideas. He wanted kind of sleek, shiny black bachelor pad in Tribeca. And he showed me apartments of some of his buddies that looked that way. And she wanted a kind of white Victorian house in Westchester. Yeah. And you know, I, at some point, I just wasn't sure how we were moving forward. Um, but we did manage to find kind of a language that was comfortable for both of them and that they both liked um, and that they both felt could express what they imagined and what they brought from their childhood and what they hoped for their children to be their, their new home. And I, I wanted to show this because one of the things that we ended up doing were probably close to 100 different renderings. I mean, you can see that the budget was not a huge concern. So we just did rendering after rendering to show them what it would look like, because they couldn't really figure it out from a plan. Um, so these are some of the sketches for this fo entry foyer. These are the photos. And I'll go through some. These are renderings of this room. Um, we put in all the furniture and the lighting. Um, one of the interesting things about these renderings is you know, they, they can become, a pre they often are a presentation tool, but they can also become a design tool in which you can allow the clients to better understand what you're doing and get them involved. And it was very easy for them to look and say, oh, I like this, I don't like this. But when I was describing things on plans and showing them pictures of, from a catalog, it was very hard for them to imagine what it would all look to, like when it was put together. Um, this is the... These are the bookcases designed in the rendering. This is the actual family room. Kitchen, we did many, many versions of the kitchen, one with a green countertop. Um, this is a kid's bathroom. Again, rendering, real photo. And um, kind of to end, I just wanted to show a collection of images um, because I think what it is that we're trying to talk about is the place of home in our mind. and. Um, the relationship between what is in our mind and the physical environment. And now we, as architects and designers, can try to create spaces for people that both evoke their memories and their hopes for the future. And so I'll just run through a whole bunch of images. 
um, of apartments. This is a duplex we did on the Upper West Side. Um, this is the kind of breakfast room by Union Square. A study, also another apartment on the um, East Village, on the West Village. Um, this was the house that was on the poster. Um, it was a really wonderful design for a tiny, tiny house that they wanted to build the second floor for. And um, we proposed this morphed skin. Um, this was called the Slice House, a small, affordable, um, sustainable house. This is a combination of three apartments on the Upper East Side. It's another duplex. Um, they combined two small one bedrooms. This is an apartment for someone who has a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> this is actually their pied a terre in the city, and then they have a big house. And this is only a fraction of what she has in her suburban house. another apartment by the UN and just a few images of some of the other projects that we've done including um, synagogue work apartments we're working with the school right now um, I think one of the interesting things is that there's a certain sensibility that um, of working with clients and working with space which I think kind of transcends the these typologies where when even if you focus on institutional work or commercial work or residential work there's a certain way of approaching the clients and approaching the spaces and the functions that um, you can bring to any project thank you You know, it's interesting because there's a way in which for architect, architects often um, residential projects seem a little less interesting. They might have a little more constraints. The budgets might be a little smaller. Everyone wants to do a museum um, or a concert hall or a library. Um, but there's something really um, intense about working with people on creating their home because it raises so many things um, that they're not even aware of are coloring their their what they imagine as a home so some of it is what they liked or disliked about their own childhood homes some of it is what they're hoping for how they see themselves um, do they really want to be fancy and have lots of parties or do they want it to be a very cozy place or are the should the kids have like a lot of space and the rest should be kind of small or do they you know we went to see this one apartment that was a huge four-story place in Chelsea and um, there was a basketball court inside and it's not an apartment it's a kind of mansion um, but then the kids had these tiny rooms because the parents really believed that you know people shouldn't hide in their bedrooms they should have a space but they should all be out of their rooms and doing stuff together. So I think that just trying to think about home raises so many questions, both about ourselves and about architecture. And I think um, the other thing that we often forget is that there are a lot of cultural biases that we think, oh, an apartment is what we know. But they weren't always like that. So the whole idea of having private space is something that started like in the 18th century. It's kind of a very part of the project of modernity of individuals, individualism and um, autonomy. Um, people a while ago didn't really think that was important. Even, um, even royalty, like the kids all shared a bedroom. There was no notion of privacy in the same way. So I think when we try to think about how homes might also evolve, it's also really interesting to try to think about the ways in which gender identity and gender roles might change the way we design homes, um, our relationship between privacy and, and the outside, how you know, our friends are with us all the time on our cell phones, so like, what does it really mean to be at home 
alone. Um, so those were some of the things that kind of triggered my interest in, in thinking about this more. I'm curious what Nava would add to that. Just a little plug for the book. It's not the skinniest book, but it's not a coherent like story narrative. You can just open it every time, and whatever page you're on, just start reading. It's very kind of meditative and interesting. And if you and you could read just little bits of pe and pieces whenever you feel inspired to. So I was curious if you had thoughts about this, or if it's talked about in the book. But I think about this idea of. Of, a, of your home as like a house, it's like a structure. And in some ways, like in particular with like, I see it more like in sort of suburban communities. It's a sort of like living within a context, but living outside of it also. Like um, you have nature on the outside and all the elements and there's the, the idea of shelter, but it's almost like, a, it's like two separate things and sort of like, almost like pushing away nature to a certain extent and the dangers that it presents and almost even like this idea of um, it's being able to control something um, so I think about that that sort of this idea of like home um, almost like philosophically could be a way to sort of like negate death you know by trying to have this idea of a home does the book talk about these sort of things do you have ideas about this like so the book definitely has parts on that, although I can't kind of think of a good line right, right now. But, you know, if you think about architecture in general and buildings as kind of a, we're a very fragile species compared to most other animals. And we can't really survive, definitely not in the density of population that we now have without these shells that we create around us. So in a way, creating these is, it is kind of a, our, um, our triumph against nature, but it is our nature to do that. Like we wouldn't be here if we couldn't do that. So in a way, it's, it's a very interesting play because it's almost like the bird's nest. It's something that we do as human beings to survive. We make buildings that have electricity and sewage, which doesn't sound like a natural thing, but um, we couldn't survive without that. Um, I think maybe just to tie that to what was said before, there's a way in which we make spaces for people to be happy, but it's not just, I think, to be happy. We make spaces that allow kind of the whole human range of emotions. So we make spaces for people to be sad and to be happy and to <coughs> live and to be ill and to die. And, you know, so to me, that's one of the wonderful things about being able to be creative in this medium of creating space, which is to try to make spaces in which we feel comfortable doing all the different things we want to do. And I think if we only created spaces that were beautiful and happy, we'd be very, we wouldn't be doing the right thing. We, humanity would be suffering in a way. Um, and so there's a way in which you know, it's kind of like modern art discovered that you can also make art out of the ugliness of life. It's not just portraits of royalty and images from the Bible. And I think in the same way, architecture needs to kind of accept that we, we deal with all the beauty and organization of society and also with all the other sides of it, um, the messy parts. And, and we need to think about how to deal with those things. Like Nava was raising the issue of, of violence and poverty and war. What does that mean when, you know, when you're designing a home? Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Brothers, our dog, an outside cat. Later, my grandmother moved in with us. And despite the tight quarters, my mother wanted each child to have their own space and built lofts and nooks for each of us. We never really had a living room. The center of activity was a large sun-filled kitchen. A platter of dried fruit and nuts were always waiting for a stream of friends and visitors that passed through. 
And while the kitchen was the social heart of our home, my father's library was its intellectual, almost sacred counterpart, housing almost over 10,000 books, including some ancient manuscripts. And though we knew not to interrupt my father's studies, we were always welcome to come in to discuss our homework or social situations. But my home extended beyond our own apartment. My home included the eclectic group of neighbors that lived in the building, a collage of Israeli society in the 70s. On the ground floor, with exclusive use of the garden, lived Rosa. She was a short, elderly woman who immigrated from Istanbul with a bright gold tooth to some theoretical structures that frame my understanding of the architectural experience. And I will end with constructive thoughts on how we design homes for clients. Have you noticed how heavily our language relies on architectural metaphors? We enter a discussion. We structure a deal. There are foundations and overarching ideas, thresholds, cornerstones. We envelop, we shelter, we contain. Here's a little assignment. Try to think while we're speaking of other words like that that come from architecture that we use in just to talk about thinking and feeling. Let's enter through the front doorway that Gaston Bachelard, the French philosopher and phenomenologist, invites us to use in his book, The Poetics of Space, which inspired the title of this presentation. He writes, if I were to name the chief benefit of the house, I should say the house shelters dreaming. The house protects the dreamer. The house allows one to dream in peace. Thought and experience are not the only things that sanction human value. The value that belongs to daydreaming marks humanity in its depth. Generate new spatial experiences. The firm believes in innovative and responsible design and is committed to sustainable buildings. Um, so at this time, I'd like to first welcome Esther Sperber, followed by Navis Steiner. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Nava, to, for inviting me. And I'm really happy to be here. I have to say, I've spoken to architects and um, interior designers, and I've spoken to psychologists, but I've never spoken to kind of a mixed crowd. So I'm excited to try this experiment. Um, home. What a wonderful and provocative word and idea for an architect who loves psychoanalysis. A word that evokes layers of feelings, memories, hopes, along with need, loss, and mortality. I'd like to explore the notion of a home from three perspectives. I invite you to join me as we enter through a few memories of my own childhood. I will then turn, it derives direct pleasure from its own being. And he continues, now my aim is clear. I must show that the house is one of the greatest powers of integration of thought and memory and dreams, thoughts and memories and dreams of mind, mankind. The binding principle in this integration is the daydream. Bachelard's work aspires to expand the range of what we see as human thought and to position daydreaming and imagination at the center, alongside, or perhaps even in place of rational thinking. For Bachelard, the home is the sanctuary in which daydreaming and these kind of thoughts can take place. The word home, of course, is not identical to the, worm, to the word house. Home is both a place and a mental idea. It is a colored, dense, heavy metaphor from its very beginning. When I say home, I first think of my own childhood home. I grew up in Jerusalem in an apartment on the second floor of a small building. I lived in this home with my parents, my sisters and brothers. 
the BFA Interior Design Department and Student Health and Counseling Services at the School of Visual Arts, which is very well represented at the front <laughs> row here, <laughs> um, present Home and uh, the Poetics of Space. It's a presentation uh, by Esther Sperber and uh, Nava Steiner. Um, Esther Sperber uh, founded Studio ST Architects in 2003 after working at um, Pi Partnerships Architects for five years, um, during which time she had the privilege of working closely with MI, uh, Mr. I. M. Pi, um, Pei, excuse me. Uh, she's born and raised in Jerusalem, Israel. She completed her undergraduate work at uh, Technion and came to New York in 1997 uh, to complete a master's degree at architecture at Columbia University. Um, Esther writes and lectures on architecture and psychoanalysis. Just a little bit about Studio ST Architects. It's a full service, woman owned architectural firm located in Manhattan. Uh, it is dedicated to exploring the embedded logic of materials and structures to generate.